Earning your degree online doesn't mean you have to go about it alone. At Capella University, we're here to support you when you're ready. From enrollment counselors who get to know you and your goals, to academic coaches who can help you form a plan to stay on track. We care about your success and are dedicated to helping you pursue your goals. Going back to school is a big step, but having support at every step of your academic journey can make a big difference. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. If you send hey, they send hey. But with opening moves on Bumble, you can get to better chats faster. Because if you send most underrated summer activity, they send eating spicy soup in front of the air conditioner on full blast. And that's something you can work with. You're still making the first move, but you can choose a question or write your own to get sent to all your matches. So you can relax and see what they come back with. Download Bumble and try it for yourself. ABC Wednesday. I'm Joan, and I'm your first Golden Bachelorette. Joan's getting a second, second chance. This is about everybody like me navigating, trying to find love at this age. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have hope. Because love never ages. Golden age doesn't mean you're old. Old is a state of mind. I got a lot of living to do. The Golden Bachelorette. Series premiere Wednesday on ABC and stream on Hulu. Man, you are one pathetic loser. <laughs> Can you, like, shut up? <laughs> if you just read the bio for Dr. Steve, host of Weird Medicine on Sirius XM 103 and made popular by two really comedy shows, Opie and Anthony and Ron and Fez, you would have thought that this guy was, was a bit of, uh, you know, a, a clown. Why can't you give me? The respect that I'm entitled to! I've got diphtheria crushing my esophagus. I've got Ebola virus dripping from my nose. I've got the leprosy of the heart valve exacerbating my incredible woes. I want to take my brain out and blast it with the wave, an ultrasonic echographic and a pulsating shave. I want a magic pill for all my ailments, the health equivalent of Citizen Kane. And if I don't get it now in the tablet, I think I'm doomed and I'll have to go insane. I want a requiem for my disease. So I'm paging Dr. Steve. Dr. Steve. From the world-famous Cardiff Electric Network Studios in beautiful downtown Tukey City. It's weird medicine, the first and still only uncensored medical show in the history of broadcast radio. Now a podcast. I'm Dr. Steve with my little pal, Dr. Scott. Traditional Chinese medicine provider gives me street cred with the whack alternative medicine assholes. Hello, Dr. Scott. Hey, Dr. Steve. And my partner in all things, Tacey. Hello, Tacey. Hello. This is a show for people who would never listen to a medical show on the radio or the internet. If you have a question you're embarrassed to take to your regular medical provider, if you can't find an answer anywhere else, give us a call. 347-766-4323. That's 347. Follow us on Twitter at, twi- uh, at Weird Medicine or at Dr. Scott WM. It's hard for me to say. Follow us on X. It's still Twitter. It's still Twitter to me, damn it. Visit our website at drsteve.com for podcasts, medical news, and stuff you can buy. Most importantly, we are not your medical providers. Take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Don't act on anything you hear on this show without talking it over with your health care provider. Don't forget uh, to check out stuff.drsteve.com. That's stuff.drsteve.com. That makes a huge difference just using that. Thank you for using it. Uh, you can just click through to Amazon or you can scroll down and see stuff that we talk about, including the Roadie, R-O-A-D-I-E, a robotic tuner and the roadie coach that'll teach you how to play a stringed instrument. You can uh, go to stuff.drsteve.com or you can go to roadie.drsteve.com. And then uh, Dr. Scott's website, it's simply herbals.net, uh, which we'll be talking about in a minute. And patreon.com slash weird medicine. Um, the live streams are starting to roll out. I'm trying to do them at least every other Friday night and sometimes every Friday night. And I'm working on the technical details. I'm thinking, though, having two studios in this house. Well, we have four now. I have one for doing the uh, bits for uh, Normal World with Dave Landau on Blaze TV. Uh, I'll be doing a regular segment on there called Ask Dr. Steve. And I have to have a teleprompter and i got to be in front of a green screen. And then they fiddle with it and do stuff. 
Uh, and then I have the live stream studio, and then we have the music studio. Oh, and then the ham radio studio, oh, and yeah. then the voice studio here. It's kind of too many studios. So I'm thinking I'm going to uh, switch the live streams into here. Technically, it'll be better. And I think it's just it's overkill to have a separate studio just for every other Friday night doing a live stream. But I am going to change these cameras. These cameras right now are too far away and they just, you know, I have a degree in television directing and it really just messes up my sensibility. They're conveniently placed for this room because they're out of our way, but they kind of suck. So I'm going to work on that. Um, and anyway, so patreon.com slash weird medicine. Uh, if you want to leave us a tip, you could go to tips.drsteve.com and spell out doctor. And uh, supposedly you can leave a message on there and it comes up on our live stream. I don't know. I, I, no one's done it yet. So we don't push that kind of stuff. But if you wanted to do it, uh, I would, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if I can make it interesting. There's this guy, uh, Patrick Melton, and he's very controversial, but he has the most um, – what's the word I'm looking for? It is comprehensive and advanced tip system I've ever seen. You go to his tip thing, and you could pick uh, one of the characters from this universe. Hmm. Like let's say you want to have Aaron from Steel Toe Radio say your – your word. So they have an AI voice uh, uh, generator, and they do all these different people. Hmm. Chad zumox has got one, uh, Kevin Brennan, all these different people. And then you put in words, and then you pay money, and then during the show it will pop up, and they've got a picture of their face, and it will say what you, whatever you told it to say in their voice. Hmm. It's crazy. Now, I'm not going to go nuts like yeah. that because that's – you can only – you can't do that if you're doing a podcast and a Sirius XM show mm -hmm. and all this stuff because, you know, we're basically an audio thing. Right. But if we ever did a video, thing, I would love to talk to him and see how the hell he did that. It sounds pretty complicated. It's very complicated, but it's cool yeah. when you see it. Sure, sure. Um, but anyway – uh, but you, that's tips.drsteve.com. And then if you want me to say fluid to your mama, um, it's very inexpensive, five bucks. So I'll say whatever you want me to say at cameo.com slash weird medicine. Check out Dr. Scott's website at simplyherbals.net. That's simplyherbals.net. Somebody sent me a picture of CBD nasal spray, and it was not yours. Mm -hmm. So some, somebody out there is also making it. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> But anyway, I haven't tried theirs, but of all the CBD nasal sprays that I've tried, Dr. Scott's is the best. Far superior. Far <laughs> superior. That's check right. him out. Simplyherbals.net. Don't forget to check out uh, drsteve.com. Um, that's drsteve.com. And, um, you know, whatever. So uh, I, I do have a story that I want to do if I can figure out a way to bring it back up because I had it. Uh, uh, there we are. Th this is huge. Um, this is a big one. Uh, diabetes breakthrough. FDA-approved drugs regenerate insulin production in 48 hours in type 1 diabetics. Ooh. Okay, we're in... Yeah. We're another step closer to reducing the need for round-the-clock insulin injections to manage diabetes after a new study showed how insulin-producing cells could be regenerated in the pancreas. You know, we've been talking about pancreas transplant or islet cell mm -hmm. transplants, or as Dr. Scott calls them, islet cells, because that's how they pronounce it in <laughs> China. That's what he says. Anyway, so, um, uh, you know, we've been talking about that. We've been talking about artificial pancreas. Mm -hmm. Well, hell, we didn't think about a drug that might be able to just regenerate the cells that make insulin. Wow. So the pancreas has two different effects. It has exocrine effects. In other words, exocrine glands are those that secrete something into something else, but not the bloodstream. Okay. So the pancreas produces pancreatic enzymes that are digestive enzymes. They help to break down fat. And if you don't have that, you end up with... Um, um, you know, steatorrhea, which is basically um, uh, uh, oil 
globules in your bowel that have, go through undigested. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when you have this sort of diarrhea with it, you'll see oil floating on the surface. So if you have that, mm-hmm. you may have a problem with what's what we would call pancreatic insufficiency. Gotcha. But it also has endocrine functions as well. And one of the most important things that it secretes into the bloodstream. So an endocrine gland secretes things into the bloodstream. Testicles are endocrine glands when they secrete testosterone into the bloodstream. The thyroid is endocrine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, um, the uh, uh, pancreas secretes insulin in response to uh, elevated um, blood sugars. Okay, so you have to sense that the blood sugar is elevated, then you have to secrete insulin in response to it. Then you got to stop secreting it when the blood pre- blood sugar gets uh, starts to come down. Mm-hmm. Not doing that from eating tons of carbs, where the insulin overshoots and then they end up with low uh, insulin or I'm sorry, low blood sugar levels, and then the body t- starts turning down the sensitivity mm-hmm. to that signal is what causes type 2 diabetes, Mm -hmm. okay? So that just sort of give you the background of the pancreas. Anyway, uh, in type 1 diabetics, there is some immune thing, whether it's, we don't still know what the trigger is. If it's a virus or a a virus or or bacteria or something. Sure, but something. There there is some some antigen that we become uh, exposed, that we get exposed to, the body develops an immune response to it. And then when that thing is gone, whatever it is, virus, bacteria, parasite, whatever, then um, those antibodies turn against the cells in the pancreas because there's something similar there. Okay. And they kill them. And then when they kill them, you don't have... um, uh, the ability to produce insulin anymore. Your blood sugar goes up. You show up in the hospital the first time with a thing called diabetic ketoacidosis. That's almost 100% of the time how kids will present okay. with uh, – and that is diabetic, meaning you know they, they're pissing like a racehorse and they've got high glucose. Keto, they are making ketone bodies because they can no longer uh, take sugar – and from the bloodstream and put it into cells and use it for energy. So they have to start burning fat. Mm-hmm. And that produces ketone bodies. And then acidosis because, well, they become acidotic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, their uh, hydrogen and potassium start to shift. And they're trying to buffer the, the hydrogen ions, which are the acid ions. And then they fail and they end up coming in with a very low pH. Okay. And this is a medical emergency. Back in the day... If you had a kid with di- that had diabetes, uh, you know, in the 1500s, they didn't survive. Oh, gosh, yeah. And, uh, but now the, the treatment is to get them on an insulin drip, get the blood sugar down. As soon as you start to, it starts to come down, you actually have to start glucose because they need energy too. Mm-hmm. So, and if you, if you stop the, the insulin drip when their blood sugar becomes normal – then it's you, too late. You, no, but no, you, it's too early. You <laughs> fucked early, up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you fucked up. Uh, because and I see this a bunch in or interns. Okay, where yeah. they will start the insulin drip and then they say, "Oh, now their blood sugar's down to one twenty. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, and then they stop it and then it just comes right back. Right back. Again. Okay, gotcha. And then you have all kinds of things with the pH shifting. Is you've got to look at phosphorus levels and potassium levels because if their potassium is normal when they come in, it ain't normal. Mm. Because they've been pissing out potassium mm-hmm. to try to replace, um, to try to buffer out the uh, hydrogen ions because they're, they're trading places in the cells. Mm-hmm. And so you'll get a bunch of potassium comes out of the cells as the body shoves these acid, you know, the pro- naked protons into the cells. Okay. And they exchange. So the potassium comes out and it's floating around the bloodstream. They piss it out. Mm. So if they had, it should be high. Right. Right. In the bloodstream. It should be. If it's normal, it's actually low. And low potassium can lead to cardiac, severe cardiac problems. So when all of a sudden you get that blood sugar down and the acidosis goes away, Mm -hmm. 
right? Because mm. you've got insulin going in there. All of a sudden, the potassium will precipitously drop because it was actually low anyway. Mm. And uh, particularly as those potassium ions start to work their way back into the cells, and then it's not in the bloodstream anymore. Mm. So anyway, there's a whole lot of sh- shit that goes on during diabetic ketoacidosis, and it's a real process to stay on top of it. Yeah. Well, it, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to ever deal with that yeah, anymore? Yeah, sure. So here we go. Um, this is uh, the breakthrough was made by getting pancreatic ductal progenitor cells. These are the cells that give rise to the tissues lining the pancreas's ducts to develop uh, the function of beta cells that are usually ineffective or missing in people with type 1 diabetes. So what they did was they took these ductal progenitor cells that are supposed to make duct cells and said, you know, instead of making ducts, Make some insulin, will you? Mm-hmm. Mm. So pretty cool. I know. Who, this is a real out of the box answer uh, because we were looking at stem cells and all oh, this stuff. Is just yeah. why not? Well, these are kind of stem cells. That's what I was going to say. Almost like a stem cell. It's almost like a stem cell. Yep. Um, research, but they, but they're already. The difference between these and stem cells is stem cells have not really differentiated yet. Okay. These things have already differentiated. Mm-hmm. They are differentiated that they're supposed they are stem cells to make ducts, mm-hmm. not to do anything else. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> so they investigated a new use for drugs already approved by the FDA that target this um, Echo ZH2 enzyme in human tissue. Ordinarily, this enzyme controls cell development, providing important biological check on growth. And uh, there are two small molecule inhibitors called GSK-126. Oh, that sounds like um, a – that's probably Glaxo, right? Glaxo a GSK-126. Yeah, Could you look that up and see if it's a Glaxo drug? And Tazimetastat, already approved for use in cancer treatments, were used to take off some of the breaks imposed by the EZH2, allowing the progenitor duct cells to develop functions similar to those of beta cells. So basically what they kind of did was say, we're going to allow you to become a sort of a cancer that we can control. Wow. <laughs> right? Yep. Because these this uh, molecule usually prevents cancer cells from forming. And they're like, eh, in this case, let's just let this up. Now, I wonder... If um, mm-hmm. the, these people are going to, you know, if this drug is going to predispose people to malignancy, we'll see. Oh. Uh, targeting EZH2, because there's always some downside, sure, right? sure, 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 sure. Targeting EZH2 is fundamental to beta uh, cell regenerative potential. Reprogrammed pancreatic ductal cells exhibit insulin production and secretion in response to physiologic glucose challenge. Holy shit. So, in other words, not only do they produce ins- or insulin, but they do it in response to being exposed to higher levels of glucose. Hmm. Previous re- research had suggested cells that give rise to duct lining, which also help manage stomach acidity, okay, could be converted into something like beta cells in the right environment. I wonder how they figured that one out. That's fascinating. I'd love to have one of these researchers on to explain that one. Now we have a good idea how to do it. Crucially, the new cells can sense glucose levels and adjust insulin production accordingly, just like beta cells. In type 1 diabetes, which the study focuses on, the original beta cells are mistakenly destroyed, okay, by the body's immune system. All right, I'll give myself a bell for that. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. Uh, Mm -hmm. Which then means blood glucose and insulin must be managed with regular injections. Uh, The tests carried out by the team showed the same reaction in tissue samples taken from two individuals with type 1 diabetes aged 7 and 61, and one aged 56 without diabetes, suggesting it could work across the generation. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Steve, I don't know who makes this. Okay. Does it say anything about the drug that's interesting at all, Tays? Well, GSK-126... is recognized as an inhibitor or enhancer of zest homolog dash two activity. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. And it's considered a potential anti tumor drug. Right. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, I I guess when you inhibit these things, they activate, and when you inhibit uh, them in cancer cells, it's it like an, 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 I'm going to have to learn more about it. It's that. like those adaptogenic 
herbs I, or adaptogenic drugs that kind of do what you need them to do in that space. Well, maybe so. You know, yeah. So I'm going to have to become an expert on this over the next little bit because this is going to be something we're going to get asked about. But this is a big mm-hmm. deal. Uh, the you, research yeah. was published in Signal Transduction and Targeted Therapy. Now, uh, okay, so these are FDA-approved drugs. They are not FDA-approved for type 1 diabetes. Gotcha. So that's a little bit of a misleading um, uh, headline as per usual. <laughs> But they are FDA approved, which means they have been through phase one, phase two, and phase three, and they are in phase four for cancer. So we don't have to worry too much about the safety aspect. We already know those numbers. They'll have to do a perfunctory phase three. I don't think they'll have to do phase one or phase two for these drugs Mm -hmm. for this particular indication. It's going to take a drug that's off the shelf and do uh, and look at it for a different indication. And, it, and, it, and that's when someone like, I mean, maybe with your, your experience, could do, could write it off-label. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Anybody could write it yeah, off-label. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. problem is getting insurance to pay for these. I suspect these are things pretty are expensive? fabulously expensive. I would think so, yeah. Fabulously. Yes. I would think yeah. so. So, but those studies will be done. Um, if one of you all wants to go to yeah. clinicaltrials.gov. I will. And look at one of these drugs and see if um, if there's anything there. But anyway, all right. So yeah, clinical. If you are if you have type one diabetes and you're interested in getting into one of these trials, they are going to be recruiting if they're not already very soon. And uh, you go to clinicaltrials.gov, put in type one diabetes for the. Um, uh, for the condition, and then the keyword would be um, GSK126, or do you want me to spell this for you, Dr. Scott, because other people may want to be following along with sure. this. Sure. Still- T- are you there? Are you in there? Almost. Oh, wow. Well, okay. well, well, well the, here's the thing. It, it, it changed. Um, um, what? The... Uh, the old clinical trials website is, of course, a different website now. It is. It's a different UL, URL. Really? It's not clinicaltrials.gov anymore? It's got. Yes, um, it is. I'm there right now. Okay. Type 1 diabetes. <laughs> Look! It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I swear to God. It's okay. I'm, I put in type 1 diabetes, Tazimetastat, and uh, let me put that in as intervention, and then we'll just see if we come up with anything interesting. Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay. It's okay, buddy. I'm forbidden. <laughs> he is forbidden. Uh, really? It says forbidden. Mm-hmm. Yes. Interesting. Okay, so far I see nothing for t- Tamozetostat or whatever the hell it is. So uh, we will stay on this and, um, and, and go from there. Okay? But it's coming. Very interesting. I published publicized this as huge breakthrough and now i'm not so sure it's such a huge breakthrough but it, i mean it is it's something though it, especially it is type a one. huge breakthrough in research and it, these are fda approved drugs but they're not quite ready for prime time as far as uh, actually giving and giving them to people i couldn't find a single uh, cl- trial on clinicaltrials.gov, but I'll keep on it. If we come up with something, I know there's a lot of type 1 diabetics in our audience and people who have type 1 diabetics in their family. If you want to look at this study, I'll be happy to send it to you. Just email me at drsteve202 at gmail.com and I'll send I'll send the uh, actual study to you to <clears throat> show your uh, you know, the patient in your family or to show their uh, doctor just so that they know that this stuff's coming. Okay? Yeah, don't you think it's still incredible, though, with with how pervasive type 1 diabetes is? It's just we There's never been a, a, a real solid answer on what causes it or how to fix it. Yeah, you it's know, crazy. It's been around for so well, long. Well, I mean, it's true. There's a bunch of things like that. ALS is another one. True. We finally kind of know the underlying molecular basis for ALS, so we should be able to develop a treatment in the next few years for yeah. that. Still not a real good idea for what why it happens. No. So dementia. Dementia, sure. Another one. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway. pretty common stuff, yep. All righty. 
Oh, my goodness. Okay. I'm very surprised I couldn't find a single study, but I may not be searching for it correctly because I'm trying to do it on the fly. Well, I'm on, and I'm on here now. I can help you now. Okay. You ain't forbid no I found, more. I, I found the back door. Oh, God. <laughs> That's Scott's <laughs> favorite thing. I'm a back door man. All right. Tacey, do you have t- topic time? Why, of Tacey? course I do. Today's episode is brought to you by Angie. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your jobs and projects done well. Let me tell you, there's the version of it where you try to do something at home, and then there's a version of it where you have someone help you, you watch them do it the right way, and you go, thank God I didn't try to do that myself. I have fully done things around the home that I think look good, and then a bang in the night, and I wake up to a shelf collapsing, a painting falling off the wall. Like it, I've, I've seen it all go south. I own a home, and I can tell you... I know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. Whatever your home project, big or small, indoor or outdoor, you can Angie that and connect with skilled professionals to get the project done well. Right now, one of my wish lists is I want a bike for my condo in Milwaukee and I would love to rig it up on a pulley in the ceiling because I have one of those like lofted ceilings, but I'm so scared to try that on my own. Angie has 20 years of home experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. It's Tacy's time of topics. A time for Tacy to discuss topics of the day. Not to be confused with Topic Time with Harrison Young, which is copyrighted by Harrison Young and Area 58 Public Access. And now, here's Tacy. Well, hello. 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 Today's segment is for... The stupid people in the audience. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so, okay, Scott, pay attention. Uh, pay attention. I'm listening up. First, oh, Mr. Clinical the First topic is how to wash your penis. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. I will oh, we wash, all need that. Wash your pubic mound and the skin around the base of the penis as well as the skin between your thighs and your pubic mound. <laughs> okay. What, did, uh, what, is there a reason that you brought this up? Or did you just happen across it? I'm it's, just wondering if I have a problem. It's the second half of the everything you need to know about oh, penis health. Oh, okay. That probably would have been good. Um, <laughs> I, I am going to confess that I am stupid. I bought these sheath underwear, and they say, oh, you got this pocket for your junk and all this. I can't figure out how to work the fucking things. They're underwear, and I cannot figure them out. <laughs> yeah, don't they have, like, the cut or something? To- I, I would show you, except I don't want to just pull my junk out um, in, in front of you. But um, when I, I, there is a pouch in there, but I, I can't. It's and if I have to piss, if I have to piss really bad, like if I'm at work mm. and I'll hold it for a long time, and then I get in there and I can't get my junk out <laughs> because they're boxer briefs and they're real tight, yeah. like sh- skin tight. Yeah. So I can't just pull the underwear out of the way. Right. And I reach in there and and there's it's just a blind pouch, and then oh. you have to reach in there and then get in this other thing and then pull your junk out. It's the craziest Man. damn thing I've ever seen. I'll, That's terrible for prost- prostate <laughs> He's issues. He's going to show it to you later. Yes, I can't well, wait. Well, I do. I, I, I got him out today and looked at him. <laughs> I said, I am not stupid. <laughs> Anytime I do that, I can usually figure something out. Like if it's something that's been driving me crazy, it's right. like I'm not dumb. I can no, figure it out. No. I can't figure them out. <laughs> it's like a trap door. I love the way they feel, though. They're my favorite underwear I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And they're not sponsors of the show. Uh, I I was a Tommy John guy, mm. but the I bought these sheath boxer briefs by accident because mm. I thought I was buying just regular briefs because I don't like the saltwater taffy yeah. scrotum against oh, the goodness. against the thigh feeling. No. But um, uh, and these don't do that; they're oh, perfect. Well. Huh. But I can't figure them out. They're, <laughs> it's too complicated. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> I know. Okay. Anyway, go ahead, Dace. So I, I obviously I need some help. Yes. Tip number two: wash the shaft of your penis. Mm. Mm. If you have a foreskin, gently pull water. it back and wash it. This helps to prevent smegma. 
I love to masturbate. <laughs> Slow Wash your scrotum <laughs> and the skin around it. Oh, my gosh. This is why it takes you guys so long to shower. <laughs> Wash your perineum. Mm-hmm. That's the skin between your scrotum and anus. Well, we call that the taint, don't you know? <laughs> Wash near your anus and between mm-hmm. your butt cheeks. And wash it every time you bathe. Yes. Mm. Do that last. Though, and man. and be sure to watch for unusual discharge, rashes, blisters, or warts. Ew. Okay, how to prevent STIs. What's that? Oh, sexually transmitted, transmitted. infections? Yeah, get vaccinated. Is that vaccinated. what we're calling it now? Yes. Yes, it's the new get cool Get tested word. after every that's, new partner. That's what the cool kids say. <laughs> Use a condom every time you have sex. Don't be one of those guys. That's stupid. What? To use a condom? To use to the condom? To not use a condom. Oh, to not uh, use it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, Correct. I don't like it. I can't. Does it matter if you're circumcised? <laughs> there are pros and cons. To what? Being circumcised. If you have a foreskin, pull it back gently and clean it to avoid a smegma buildup. Circumcised penises are more likely to get chafed or irritated, so use loose-fitting cotton underwear always. Circumcision doesn't affect fertility, but uncircumcised penises are more susceptible to STIs as well as condition, conditions like balanitis. Mm. Uncircumcised ones are? Yeah, you would think so. Because they're going to catch, they're gonna catch piece, one of the bugs yeah. up in there. Yeah. Okay, I thought that circumcision... Oh, uncircumcised, you yes, said. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. sorry. And it doesn't matter if you're a grower or a shower. I had the image shower. of a circumcised schlong in my head and yeah. while I was saying uncircumcised. Yeah, go ahead. It doesn't matter if you're a grower or a shower, just embrace it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the thing is, is that if it was a huge effect, mm-hmm. we would know the answer to this. We wouldn't be arguing about circumcision. Okay. Um, so it's a very small effect. If you are uncircumcised, very small number of people will be negatively impacted by that. And a very large number of people will have maybe better um, – uh, sensitivity and better sexual congress because they had it. People who have had circumcisions, a very small number of those will not get a disease they may have gotten, but uh, then the downside is the converse of the of the circumcision. And an, a circumcised person will never have to have a circumcision as an adult, which Sam Roberts would tell you sucks. So mm. um, it is a matter of choice. The problem is... The kid cannot um, consent to it. So you're doing really what amounts to a cosmetic procedure, unless it, you know it's a religious procedure. Um, uh, but you're doing a, co- <clears throat> a cosmetic procedure on a kid that cannot give consent. And that's my issue with it is an issue of autonomy because <clears throat> even kids that are 17 can't consent legally in this country to a medical procedure they can give assent in other words they can agree to it but they can't consent to it only their parents can consent right yeah. so you know that's an that's an it, that's my issue is that's a, an issue of autonomy mm-hmm. but um you know fewer and fewer people are doing circumcisions but there's still a lot of circumcisions being done and when the OBGYN does your circumcision, which was the case when I was training, it's the only time they touch a male patient mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is when they're doing cutting part of their penis off. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of odd. But um, I'm not a I'm not opposed to it. But I am saying I understand the argument. So is there are there fewer circumcisions going on these days? Is that what you're that's saying? my understanding? Okay. Yes, yeah. I'll, while Tacey's talking, I'll get those statistics. Is it normal for your penis to have a bend or a curve? A yes, little bit, yes. Slightly, but if you have a significant bend and pain in your penis when it's erect, you could have Peyronie's disease. Right. Mm-hmm. It's often caused by traumatic injury. We've talked about Peyronie's a bunch, but... Mm. Yeah, I bet you have. You got the angle of the dangle, don't you know? <laughs> Did it say in there whether it's more common to, to go to the left or to the right? No, it doesn't. does not. And I've had pe- we've had people call in talking about oh my penis when it's erect curves to the right or the left. Mm-hmm. That's actually a good thing. Whoever you are having intercourse with, instead of just having a straight 
cylinder being shoved into whatever orifice it is. It's going to be a curved cylinder, right? Mm -hmm. So the curved cylinder, let's say it's curved. The, you know, the bow of the curve is bowed to the left. Mm -hmm. So the right is, I mean, the tip is to the right. To the, right, the okay. base is to the right. The middle of it is to the left. Gotcha. When you stick that in that orifice, let's just assume it's a penis going in a vagina, but it could be anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the tip will hit the right side more than the left, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Then the middle will hit the left side more than the right. And then the base will then uh, do likewise for the right side of that orifice. So you're getting more contact that way. It actually increases the... Um, apparent girth yes, of the like penis. It, it gives the illusion of girth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, just like if you take two telescopes and separate them, mm -hmm. you can increase the aperture without mm -hmm. having a telescope that's, you know, a continent size big. Right. You know, so it increases the resolution. So it's the same sort of thing, kind of. I mean, not even <laughs> close, not even but close. it's, <laughs> you get an idea. We'll get you for it. <laughs> but, but you get the illusion, yes, the illusion that you have more growth. So yes. if you have a bit of curve, that's actually yeah. maybe a good thing. Agreed. Is use it or lose it true? No. Oh. While it's true that frequent sex has many health benefits and can boost your sex drive, can you there's mute that no part, Dr. evidence... Steve? That chastity said, can, can permanently that <laughs> or yeah. seriously damage your penis. I disagree. I think it yeah. absolutely damages. I your, think yeah, it damages. No. Your, Not according your to source. Healthline, my check, friend. Check your sources. <laughs> Dam <laughs> damages your psyche. Is there such a thing Damn as it. too much or too little ejaculate? If you're noticing that you are ejaculating a lower volume of semen than usual, it's called perceived ejaculate volume reduction. Ooh, wait, perceived ejaculate mm -hmm. volume reduction. Peaver, peaver, -E peaver, peaver. Yeah, P E V R. He's got the peaver. He's got one of that. He's got a peaver. He's, he took his peaver out in the church and showed everybody. <laughs> This could be caused by a number of things: depression, he diabetes. He was, he was took All right, Myrtle, the, shut it. In certain testicular conditions, you know. it could also be a side effect of medication. Mm -hmm. How can you maintain penis sensitivity as you age? Mm -hmm. Use tissue? it or lose it. That's easy. That's not. I Next told question. you. I've already told you. That's not how it works. Where's my bell? You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> The tissue on your penis might lose sensitivity as you age. This could be caused by friction. So use loose cotton underwear mm. instead of tight, rough uh, underwear that with, you can't get pockets. your junk out That's of. Right, with pockets. Yeah. <laughs> now, mine is very silky. The, the sheath is very silky. How can you maintain your ability to get an erection? Reduce your risk of heart disease and diabetes. Yeah, don't smoke. Oh. That's number one. Yep. What can you do to promote fertility? Mm. Certain foods. Did you know this? No. For example, spinach contains magnesium, which can boost your testosterone levels. What? Tomatoes and carrots can increase your sperm count and motility. Hmm. Other than that, the healthy lifestyle choices help maintain fertility. Exercise. Sure. But not too tight underwear because if you're wearing a jock strap all the time and you're pulling your nuts up against your body... They are supposed to be three degrees below body temperature to produce sperm. Mm -hmm. If they're constantly up in your mass, mm -hmm. then that they will uh, not be three degrees below body temperature. They won't be able to regulate their temperature, and you could become relatively, if not completely, infertile. Mm -hmm. I have, I've got a question about that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, cold, ther cold water therapy. Yeah. I just wonder if doing that too much would would in over time be possibly damaging to well you would if you were just constantly immersed in you it, guys yeah. just sure. worry about anything that can damage yeah. or do anything to well, you. Well, yeah. shrinkage it's shrinkage I, I, I did I, I got in my pool last week and it was cold. what the fuck? what's wrong with you doing the cold water therapy oh yeah I think I actually Oh, read this. I think I, I you got think it in my, your pool, though. Oh, yeah. Isn't it I, gross? No, I keep it pretty clean. Even uh, in the winter? You know, even in the winter. You don't cover it? Nope. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, he's he's highfalutin' everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you just get a cold pool like they have at uh, Shoji Spa up well, in Nashville? Well, I've got a fucking. I've got, I'll say my my pool's cold as hell. Well, I know, but <laughs> <I bet> it <laughs> it's I don't even have to really worry about. It. I just kind of, I don't only sit in it. I just go sit in the shallow end and just kind of breathe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. How long? Usually about five minutes. I used to oh love to take Lord. really cold showers. Yeah, this is different. It feels good afterward. Yeah, this is different. I, th- I thought my nuts had crawled back up inside me. Gonna, <laughs> they were going to have to descend again. Hey, oh, I've got some uh, trends on circumcision. If I can go back to that for a second. It says okay. uh, across a 32-year period from 1971 through 2010. So this is not the old, newest. Yeah. But national rate of su- newborn circumcision declined 10% overall. From 64% to 58.3%. I would have thought it was lower than that still. During this time, the overall percentage of newborns circumcised during their birth hospitalization was highest in 1981. Uh-oh, that was... Well, no, let me see. I was 86 to 89, which was 65%, lowest in 2007 at 55.4%. So it's still just above half. Go ahead, Tay. Sorry. Okay. This is about pea color. Okay, mm-hmm. and this is also stupid. Clear urine could mean you're overhydrated. Yeller to a- a- yellow, yeller. yeller. Oh my yeller. lord, <laughs> that yeller. is the most redneck. Oh, it oh, came out. I try is. for it not to. <laughs> yeller. That is Joanne speaking right it there. It is. It is. Yellow to amber urine is you considered normal. <laughs> Orange or brown urine could mean you're dehydrated. Mm. Okay. But now listen, if you get bloody, cloudy, blue, or green urine, it could indicate that you have an infection. So Correct. see a doctor. Okay. Hey, we'll go back to clear urine. Sometimes if you drink too much alcohol, you'll get clear urine. Again, because you're peeing out free water because yep. the first taste of alcohol has a little bit of a diuretic effect. Yep. Yeah, yep. that's correct. So what if you start peeing more than usual? Okay, it could be a sign of a UTI, diabetes, interstitial cystitis. Yeah, no, the people with interstitial cystitis will feel the need to pee more right. frequently, but the volume will not be increased. Right. People with diabetes will in- pee out an increased volume. That's why it's called diabetes, Dr. Scott. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you knew that. Mm-hmm. Tacey was there when we talked about this on Opie and Anthony. Di- diabetes is from the Greek word for siphon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... There's diabetes mellitus, Mm -hmm. which means that the urine that is shooting out of people like a siphon tastes like honey. Mm -hmm. Mellitus is like, you know, is, uh, you know, the Greek word for honey-like. Right. Sweet-like. And, um, yeah, like uh, miel is the Spanish term or Spanish word for for honey. Mm -hmm. And then uh, diabetes insipidus means that the stuff that came out of them was f- free water, had no taste at all. It was insipid. Gotcha. And those people had brain tumors or other problems. Mm-hmm. And the diabetes mellitus people had what our classical, what we call diabetes. Mm-hmm. In Chinese, it's, it's Shao Ke syndrome, Shao Ke, which is a wasting and thirsting disorder. Oh, yeah. That's, the, that's, that's how it's Now, do they, did they Shao distinguish Ke. between... Uh, sugar diabetes, sugar diabetes. <laughs> He's and, got the sugar. And uh, it, diabetes insipidus. Not, not. I don't think so. Okay, so they weren't really. drinking people's urine. They were civilized. Yeah. That's why. Yes, exactly right. Okay, good for them. He's got the sugar. He's got the sugar, don't you know? <laughs> And All di- right. Diabetes. God bless. And they use a vomit. I think he's got the pervert. Too. Listen, shut up, All right, people. Sorry. Okay. You're right. Is it normal for your penis to smell? I mean, like sweat, yes. But if if it if it's pungent, <laughs> Not you could have a UTI, yeast infection, bellinitis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia. Mm-hmm. Well, did you know, though, Tace, if your nose runs and your feet smell... Mm-hmm. You're built upside down, oh, bad no. bird. He's a fucking idiot. He's a fucking idiot. That's terrible. That's, terrible. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Now, when I was a kid, I was in Canada in uh, Blind River, <laughs> Ontario, and I was in this big lodge, and they had all these signs like that. Yep. And that's the one I remember. I, oh, I was funny. probably eight. Oh, how fun. And I remember seeing that and I didn't understand. It's like you build upside down. It took me <laughs> quite a while to figure out. I wasn't the brightest kid. <laughs> anyway. Oh my goodness sakes. Okay, so if your penis is sore or inflamed, it could be a certain sign of these penis conditions. Balanitis. Okay. Mm. 
Phimosis. Okay, well, ba- let's talk about what each one is. Balanitis is inflammation of the Roman war helmet. Mm-hmm. Tip, and yeah. you could get a traumatic balanitis mm-hmm. or strangulation balanitis if you pull your foreskin back and it's tight and you forget to put it, to mm-hmm. pull it, you know, to unretract it. Mm-hmm. Cuts off the blood supply and then sloughs off. Yes, that's bad. Phimosis? Yeah. Yes, that's narrowing of the, uh, of the foreskin. And then penal cancer. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. well. Self-explanatory. You're a bummer. And, yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to the cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> Although the penis doesn't have bones, the term penis fracture, or fracture is often used to refer to a penis injury where the lining inside becomes torn. Yes. This is often caused by rough sex. Yeah, so what particular um, position almost 100% of the time causes this taste? I would you know? say the woman on top. Yes, there you go. When the woman is in control. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a funny one. Mm-hmm. So, if you fracture your penis, it will turn black and blue, flatten, and it may make a popping noise. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, and it hurts gross. like a mother. Mother, it'd have to. And it's uh, very often when you've got a little bit of whiskey dick. Yep. You're not if not fully erect. The the less than fully erect, you know, cat can't scratch it type mm-hmm. type erection. You know, ballpark wiener in the microwave. That's mm. the that those erections are pretty immune mm-hmm. to fracture. But if you've got a little bit of uh, whiskey you know, dick in, yeah, a little yeah, softy, okay. yeah. If it's slightly softer than softy. normal, and it's not exactly in the right position, and the woman thrusts downward, what it'll do is it'll bend the penis in half yeah. rather than <laughs> allowing it to. And you don't even have one, and it, it still gives you the woo. Me. Oh goodness! Um, yeah, and then it'll it'll fracture, and you have to go to the emergency room, and the urologist may or may not attempt to repair it. Mm-hmm. But what's going to happen is that fracture site is going to become scarred, yep. and then you will because scar tissue is inelastic, but the surrounding tunica around the um, uh, the penis is relatively elastic. When it becomes erect, it's going to it's going to bend toward the side that is less elastic. Mm-hmm. So you'll get Peyronie's disease. It could be severe, painful, preventing intercourse. Or it could be mild, and you you can live with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, don't be so embarrassed that you don't go to oh, the emergency. Go room. quick. And if you're you know, if you don't want to go to the ER because you were cheating on your wife, go to the ER anyway. <laughs> well, in the next know, town. <laughs> yeah, the, the go prevention with. is is yeah, right. Go to the next town. <laughs> prevention is key. Uh, just don't uh, do that position. Yeah. And, you know. Anyway. So you should always seek medical attention if you experience bruises on the penis. Correct. Yellow, green, or otherwise unusual penile discharge, swelling, or inflammation of the penis. Blisters, rashes, warts, or sores on or near your penis. Yeah, don't ignore that stuff. Burning, pain, or bleeding when you urinate or ejaculate. Pain during sex, pain during an erection, and difficulty getting or maintaining an erection. She's doing this on purpose. Every guy listening to this has got their legs crossed mm-hmm. right now with their hand on their mm-hmm. chuck. Going, I mean, I just no, think it's good. It's, it's good. a really like low-level first-grade article. I'm, I, f- I feel like... Every man knows this stuff already, but yeah, they always about. like to talk about their penis. So there sure. you go. There you go. There's your little present you, from me. Yay. Hey, Steve, I have a question. Okay. I just got a text. Okay. So if you are giving Paxlovid, if you are given yes. Paxlovid. Correct. And you are lactose intolerant. Okay. Because Paxlovid has lactose in it. Okay. Does it have enough to like really bother you? No, and the thing is, is that even if it did, you can take um, an enzyme. Yeah. You know, called lactate. And it's and be worth it and to help the medicine. (laughs) Here's the thing. Um, So they are. um, I'm looking at the um, at the contraindications to this, who may not be able to take Paxlovid, pregnant, allergic reaction to Paxlovid, kidney problems, liver problems, intolerant to lactose or galactose, uh, near, near Matrovir contains a lot of lactose, 
have a lactase deficiency or glucose galactose malabsorption. <clears throat> Here's the thing. Uh, tell your primary care about it, and we'll see how severe it is. Yeah, it has a lot, but it's it may. You, here's the thing with Paxlovid, and I get into it with people. Well, twenty percent of people have have rebound, and uh, you know, Fauci took it, and he had rebound, and say, like, okay, no one ever said Paxlovid was going to keep you from getting sick, and that the Paxlovid keeps you from going to the hospital and keeps you from dying if you're at high risk. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone with HIV, for example, or sickle cell or chronic kidney disease, um, uh, or you are in a high risk group, um, uh, Down syndrome, organ transplants, any autoimmune or inflammatory conditions, anything like that. have been age greater than 65, morbid obesity, diabetes. Those people are at risk. Now, of that whole set of people that are at risk, a small minority of those are going to end up in the hospital and end up dying. It's a very small number. But this will prevent 90% of that. Right. So you're preventing 90% of a very small number. So you have to select your patients. And there are other drugs, taste, or there is another drug, molnupiravir, can be given to people who can't take Paxlovid. It's not as good as Paxlovid as far as preventing uh, hospitalization or death, but it's better than not taking anything. Yeah. And it is very well tolerated. So now, the lactate should help, though, correct? I would think the lactate would help, but you've got to talk to your primary – this is an uh, uh, in the UK, so they're saying that it is contraindicated. I have not seen that in um, the um, in the patients, I mean, you know, as far as warnings when I prescribe this stuff, because I have a lot of um, patients with um, you, you know cancer who end up with. Um, COVID-19, and I'm called on to treat them. So uh, I'm looking here to see if it, there is anything on the, on the American side. Okay, here's drug topics. Can lactose intolerant patients use this stuff? Um, oh, come on. Give me an answer. I probably should have just stopped the recording. Okay, it says here, in summary, it appears most patients who are lactose intolerant can probably tolerate the quantities of lactose that are incorporated into these oral drug products. Uh, highly sensitive patients um, may have issues with it. So you have to know your body and just talk to your primary care. But, yeah, the nermeltravir does have a lot of lactose in it, which is interesting. But, I mean, I wonder compared to a block of cheese or, you know, a bowl of ice cream, how much does it really have? You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't know. Um, well, if they're lactose intolerant, that's different than having Crohn's or something like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right. The problem is this person cannot get their primary care right now because of the holiday. Mm. What? Oh, because of Martin Luther King. Yeah. OK, so um, then let's just do this. We're going to take a second. We're going to look it up on the Paxlovid package insert. It gotcha. says Paxlovid contains lactose. Patients with rare hereditary problems of galactose intolerance, total lactase deficiency, or glucose galactose malabsorption should not take this medicine. The levels of lactose within this preparation should not routine, routinely preclude the use of this medication in those with galactosemia. So they contain less than one millimole per dose. That is to, oh, that's sodium. So they're basically sodium free. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, you know, if if they just have run of the mill lactose intolerance, they should mm -hmm. be able to take it. But again, I'm going to couch that by saying they need to talk to their primary care right. provider. Okay, does that help? Any questions? Yes, in the... and there should be also be a I'm provider sorry. on call. Yes, of course. Yeah, there's. Pretty much required to be a provider on call. We have any questions from the fluid family, Doctor Scott? Because nope. I've got a couple of uh, voicemails. No, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Hi, Doctor Steve. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to do this one. 
that this blows my mind. Uh, surely to God we didn't do this. Oh, no. see. Copper and magnetic bracelets have been proven wrong repeatedly by every scientific study. And the fact that you're entertaining it on your show is pretty hilarious. Thanks. Do you remember us ever entertaining copper or magnetic bracelets on the show? I've debunked that shit. Oh, my shit. gosh, that's been so long ago. I've debunked I that shit the, a million yeah, times nope. on this show. What I is think, the fuck is he talking no, about? I think, I think we talked about one time, and the only thing we said was that <clears throat> they they feel good, and they probably increase blood flow, but as far as fixing, I don't even agree with that. Yeah, well, but as far as increasing— That's a Dr. Scott. Thing. Yeah, well, as far as healing anything, I don't think so. Well, no, the, the magnetic fields don't even penetrate the body, and the, the copper on the outside, what the f- is that supposed to do? Yeah, well, We've looked at studies on this show before. I think oh, yeah. there's another Dr. Steve out there, mm. and he's on, like, WPIX or something like that, mm. and I think this person is talking to them because okay. I don't – if it was us, I want to know what show that was, and I want to review what we were talking about because yeah. that one pissed me off. When I said – I, I sent a text back to him and said, bro, what the hell are you talking about? All right. Um, let's see here. Hi, Dr. Steve. This is Steve from New York. Hey, I have Steve. a real question. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Oh, okay. that's a good one. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Thank you. Okay. So um, the set of all flowers fully encloses the set of all roses, right? So if you look at your Venn diagram, you got a big circle that says flowers, and then inside it is a smaller circle that says roses. Now, there's lots of other circles in there. There's some that say chrysanthemums, some that say peonies, whatever, vincus. Uh, this is analogous to that. The set of all dementias includes the set of all Alzheimer's. So all Alzheimer's patients have dementia, but not all dementia patients or Alzheimer's patients. Right. So Alzheimer's dementia has a specific sort of syndrome. It uh, starts at stage one where the patient is somewhat eccentric. I told you about my professor in medical school that got dementia, and he he had a thing called anomia, which is a classic early symptom of, of Alzheimer's dementia where you can't name things. Mm-hmm. But he had an IQ of like 220. Oh, he was Marilyn Vossavant level uh, uh, you know, IQ. Mm-hmm. And when he couldn't remember how to say deck of cards, he said a concentric stack of thin laminates. Now, who, who would even know to say that? <laughs> Nobody. I mean, that's why he was a genius. But anyway. Incredible, yeah. uh, and then they pretty much gradually marched through all the stages until if they live long enough, the last stages, they're curled up in a ball, just sort of making noises. And, uh, now, and then there's vascular dementia, which uh, goes in a stepwise fac- fashion, little mini stroke like activity where the you know parts of the brain die because of bad blood flow, and they will be okay, and then all of a sudden they'll drop in function and they'll stay there, and then all of a sudden they'll drop in function some more. It's in a stepwise fashion. Mm-hmm. Then you have other dimensions like frontotemporal dementia, or AKA Pix disease. Pix disease is a fascinating thing where people will have a burst of creativity. Taste, if you start to see me, all of a sudden I'm, I can paint you know, mm-hmm. amazing landscapes and never could do that before. Uh, and then they that that could be a sign of Pick's disease and they get more and more eccentric. And then or they also have, a sign of just you. Well, true. <laughs> I mean, true. look around. It's That's true. Cra- but, no, but, I, but I mean, you know, on a sort of pro level, I'm a dilettante. I, I get good up to a certain point and then I just move on. <laughs> but um, the... Uh, uh, that, and that's the ADHD. Mm. You know, I just get yes. bored, and so I got a million hobbies. I, um, but then they will have trouble with their interpersonal relationships, and then they'll start to decline significantly. So there's lots of different types of dementia, mm-hmm. and Alzheimer's is one of those types. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm. Does that help? Questions? Good question. That? Good All question. All right. Let's see here. Hey, Dr. Steve. Oh, we don't uh, have time have for this. Okay. We're going to do this one next time. Uh, it's a guy that has post-exercise uh, paralysis, but uh, we might have time for this one. Hi, Dr. Steve. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Hey, this is uh, Matt from uh, uh, Chicago. Hey, Matt. And uh, Chicago. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks again for uh, being awesome with all the medical stuff. I had a where they watch TV. question, so hopefully that's refreshing. Yes, um, thank you. I was curious. This phone call is actually from 2021, by the way. So, yes, that was quite refreshing at the time and still refreshing. Mm. Uh, you know, when my wife and I are, are partaking in spicy food, Indian food or whatnot, um, she'll be fine the next day. And I have the ring of fire situation, you know, kind of, uh, you know, scorched butthole, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, bad stomach issues, things like that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering why is that that she seems unfazed and I'm I'm more sensitive. You know why? What is that in certain people that can handle? They might not handle the taste, but they can handle it gastro wise. Is it more enzymes yeah. that they have that can process the spicy food or what? What's going on? Now? He's very anyway, close. Thanks a bunch. Take care. Hey, thanks, man. Uh, the the answer to this is some people are born with fewer receptors for capsaicin. Capsaicin is the molecule that causes heat. We measure it in Scoville units. So you've got your jalapenos, which most anybody can eat, and then you've got your ghost peppers and Ooh. Carolina Reapers that Ooh. have these, you know, the Scoville units in the millions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some people are just born with fewer receptors. Mm. And this makes them less sensitive to spicy foods, gives them a built-in tolerance for heat. And there is actually, the gene has been identified. It's called TRPV1. It codes for a receptor protein that binds to capsaicin, sends a signal to the brain to interpret the sensation as heat. And we know that this is true, that the capsaicin isn't inherently hot. Mm. Because you can, if you have squirrels getting in your bird food, you can, you can get capsaicin-laden bird food. The birds can eat it. They don't even notice it. Huh. The squirrels, it, it'll chase them off. Wow. Yeah, they'll eat one and go, I ain't going back to that place. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah, now people with a certain variant of the TRPV1 gene experience a stronger burn from capsaicin than those without it. And receptors can change over time. So you may be able to build a higher tolerance to high and sp hot and spicy foods, which we know that's the case. You know, if you eat more spicy food, you're going to be able to tolerate it better. But I, in my case, there are certain um, spices that mess me up. You know, I can eat ghost pepper stuff. I can my Tabasco sauce that I ferment and make into sauce is pretty hot, but I can tolerate it. I can take as much of it as I as I want. But there are certain, like if I go to the Indian restaurant, it just kills me. I love Indian food. And I can feel it working its way down through my gut. And I'd love to know which particular spice is hurting me. It may not be the, the peppers. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe something else. Yep. But I can feel it, and like it starts in my stomach, then the next day I can feel it in my small intestine, then I feel it in the large bowel. It's uh, horrendous. Mm -hmm. Not it's fun. just a, you know, a sharp sort of burning pain. So, uh, yeah, we're all different. You know, I mean, you got a continent of a billion people that can eat that stuff just fine, and there's double me can't tolerate it. So, but anyway, all right. You got anything else? You got anything from the fluid family now, Doctor Scott? Nope, I don't remember. Okay, well, they've, been, they've been pretty uh, okay. Fluid family, chilling. They've been all pretty right. chill today. Well, thank you all. Uh, thanks always go to Doctor Scott. Thanks, Tacy. Thanks. Everyone who's made this show happen over the years. Listen to our Sirius XM show on the Faction Talk channel, Sirius XM channel 103, Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, on demand and other times at Jim McClure's pleasure. Many thanks to our listeners whose voicemail and topic ideas make this job very easy. Go to our website at drsteve.com for schedules, podcasts, and other crap. Until next time, check your stupid nuts for lumps. Quit smoking, get off your asses, get some exercise. We'll see you in one week for the next edition of Good Medicine. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.